to take any of the words in this and change them into anything else. And so I'd like to do a reading. Um, I've chosen a little section at the beginning in case you haven't read it so that I, I don't give any spoilers away. Um, and really I'd like to just share it with you just to, get, for, to give you a sense, if you haven't read it, um, the lyricism and the voice of this beautiful novel. The work of the previous day had given her a hangover. She realized this only when she was about to make the move. A hard day's work has always left an after effect on me, so why should I worry, she told herself. The clock would strike four in the morning. It was Tuesday, to her like any other day, for even Friday was not different. To men, perhaps it was, as they all went to a praying place or to a mosque, to women, Friday only meant more work, more washing and more cooking to be done. She had nothing to carry along with her. She never owned much, only a spare sheet to wear when the one she had on got dirty and it was old. The muezzin had not announced the nearing of the morning prayers. The first wailing had not been heard. The sound of watering camels had not yet started. She stopped as if to take something, but it was only to ease up the hangover. She touched her toes and heard the sound her joints made. The hut was very dark. There were no matches to light, no maps to take. The only fire which provided a dim light had been blown out before Ebla and her friend had fallen asleep. Ebla's colleague was still snoring her head off. Ebla stretched her long arms down to pick up her shoes and the sheet. She had placed them somewhere in the evening. She took both of them in her hands and walked out of the hut. She put one foot outside and one inside and kept standing there motionless. For a while she hesitated, not wondering whether or not she should go. She had settled that, and there was nothing to make her change her mind. But should she or shouldn't she tell her colleague in the hut where she intended to go? She lifted her foot back. Her body stood an inch away from the door. She could feel the mild wind. She turned her back on the door and headed inwards. She stopped a few inches from where her friend lay snoring. She wanted to call to her friend and say that she had decided to escape. She opened her mouth. But before she was able to say anything, she heard a bang on the outside wall. She stopped, wanting to find out what had made the noise, to see if anybody was outside and to regain her lost self. For she did not know for a fraction of a second who she was. The noise had not been repeated and Ebla was prepared to go out and not wake up her colleague. Oh, it's much better this way, she thought to herself. She swayed as if she were drunk. The whole area was silent. Not a sound was to be heard. The unmarried males slept outside the huts and in the clearing. White sheets covered their bodies. Ebla passed near them, not making any sound. She walked barefooted and wrapped the sheet around her shoes and put the bundle between her arm and ribs. She tiptoed as if she were a thief who had preyed upon someone whom he knows. She cast her eyes downwards. She finally reached the entrance to the dwelling. It was a thorn fence which had just been built. There was a stick put across which served as the gate. Should she go underneath? Or should she lift the stick? She stopped and bent down to see if she could pass underneath. Being unable to do that, she lifted the stick. The gate creaked. The prickles stood out and the stick had touched some of them as she lifted it. Her heart began pounding frightfully fast. She thought she had made a loud noise. She looked around, but there was nothing coming. Nobody, not a living soul. The croc the cock crowed. Then there was silence again. She replaced the stick in a hurry and stood on the outside of the dwelling boundary. My God, I'm out, she said to herself. 
She headed west and in the direction where the travelers developed when they would pass by. She hid herself under a big tree and near the detour, which encircled the main road. Alhamdulillah, subhanallah, is the kafina. She kept on repeating these words, which did not convey much to a young woman of her background. She said them because she had heard others say them. She knew the words were Arabic and that they were God's words and sacred. She counted on her finger joints just as she had seen others do it. Actually, she let her thumbs run over her fingers one by one. Thus rhythmically and sometimes inaccurately she counted, saying each word three times until she had said every word 99 times. That was the number that represented God's names. Fate in her faith, Ebla put her faith and her fate along with it into the hands of God. And I am certain that God will understand my situation. And of course he won't let me down. If I'm asked by the caravan people where I'm going, what shall I say? I suppose I must tell them the truth. But what is truth? That which corresponds to the notions we have in mind? Or that which corresponds to our doings? Why do we think differently from the way we behave? If I tell the truth, then it won't get me anywhere for certain. If I say I ran away because my grandfather had decided to give my hand in marriage to a man, an old man, I must say to drive home the point, a man, old or young. Age doesn't determine the genuineness of marriage, does it? Sometimes there are old men who are much more likable husbands than young ones. <laughs> People are argumentative and surely they will bring up this question. You are allowed to tell lies if the situation makes it necessary, said Prophet Muhammad. That is what our Prophet has said, and everything he said ought to be obeyed. But is this a necessity, I mean? Telling lies under the present circumstances. Every situation has its serious side. Is this the most serious situation, or are there many more to follow it? Ebla had not been able to reach a decision when she heard the caravans approaching her. Things appeared to crowd in upon her instantly.